Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I am Adrian Ford, and we are here for another poetry discussion. Another poetry discussion that is part of National Poetry Month here on Strip Coverlet. National Poetry Month, a poetry discussion every day of the month. Uh, 30 poetry discussions in 30 days. We have Sundays with Sylvia Plath, Mondays with William Blake, Tuesdays with Edgar Allan Poe, Wednesdays with William Shakespeare, Thursdays with Emily Dickinson, Fridays with... Uh, Robert Frost, and here slumming Saturdays with Charles Bukowski. Uh, so if you find yourself here by chance but not design, consider hitting the subscribe button. Stick around. Literature is the only thing I talk about on this channel. Uh, poetry, short stories, novel read-alongs, things like that. But also, my personal channel is a mere 46 subscribers away from the 1,000 subscriber mark. A, a link to that channel is in the description below. Over there, I talk a lot about philosophy. I talk about some cultural stuff. I talk about movies. I do all that sort of stuff. So follow me over there if you were interested in that sort of thing as well. But we have here a Bukowski poem other than Victory. Victory was what I promised at the beginning of the month, but I couldn't find stable sourcing of the Charles Bukowski poem Victory. Everything that I, every time I found that it was a little bit different from the other ones, I think that part of this is that it was not a published or anthologized poem. And I didn't have it in any of, well, not published or anthologized, I think during Bukowski's life. I think it's been anthologized a couple times, maybe since uh, in Bukowski anthologies, of course, but I was not able to really find anything definitive on what that poem actually is or uh, how it looks. So I have here instead one of my personal sort of, um, I won't necessarily say favorites, because it's a poem that doesn't make me feel very good, and it's not that it makes me feel very good in a an artistic way way, right? Like, um, Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck does not make me feel very good, but I think it's an important piece of literature, and I think that you sort of grow from experiencing it. This one is one of those ones that always kicks me in the pants and reminds me that I'm not doing a good job at life, uh, which, is, which is important. It's a good thing to be reminded that you're not doing a very good job in life, uh, because then you have a little bit of a chance to recourse to correct yourself to get back on a some type of path where you think you might. Anyway, let's just get into it. Air and light and time and space. You know, I've either had a family, a job, something has always been in the way. But now, I've sold my house, I've found this place, a large studio, you should see the space and the light. For the first time in my life, I'm going to have a place and a time to create. No baby. If you're going to create, you're going to create whether you work 16 hours a day in a coal mine or you're going to create in a small room with three children while you're on welfare. You're going to create with a part of your mind and your body blown away. You're going to create blind, crippled, demented. You're going to create with a cat crawling up your back while the whole city trembles in earthquakes, bombardment, flood, and fire, baby. Air and light and time and space have nothing to do with it and don't create anything except maybe a longer life to find new excuses for. That's air and light and time and space. And I want to read it one more time, because I get carried away when I read it. So maybe I didn't put emphasis on the right syllables. You know, I've either had a family, a job, something has always been in the way. But now, I've sold my house, I found this place, a large studio. You should see the space and the light. For the first time in my life, I'm going to have a place and a time to create. No, baby. If you're going to create, you're going to create whether you work 16 hours a day in a coal mine, or you're going to create in a small room with three children while you're on welfare. You're going to create with a part of your mind and your body blown away. You're going to create blind, crippled, demented, you're going to create with a cat crawling up your back while the whole city trembles in earthquakes, bombardment, flood, and fire. 
Baby, air and light and time and space have nothing to do with it, and don't create anything except maybe a longer life to find new excuses for. So, just a personal anecdote here. One of the reasons that I have chosen to live the life that I've chosen to live sort of sort of as a recluse, you, you, part, you, a part of it for me is um, absolutely disposition. It's just the, the way that I am, the way that I was born, the way that I was going to be. Part of it is social conditioning for sure. But when I graduated, I spent some time, graduated with my uh, bachelor's degree, I spent some time with a former professor, sort of um, doing nothing at all related to what my degree was for, nor what he taught, but it was sort of a uh, an opportunity that I... I I had to take um, sort of a very, this was a time in my life where I was gearing up to go get a master's degree and I was working three jobs and I was writing in the, uh, after I got off work. So sometimes in the evening, sometimes at night, um, very, very difficult, very pressing for me. But it was one of these, so sort of where I come from, you don't do that. You don't put your life on hold to go get a master's degree, especially a master's degree in something so worthless as creative writing. So I was taking on myself a whole lot of pressure. And I remember distinctly this this former professor of mine. He had commitments. He had a professorship. He had a family. He had a child. He had um, his parents. He had his wife's parents. All of these things. And he would always sort of talk to me about ideas for stories that he had. Things he was going to write someday. I've got this idea. Short story I want to write. And he never did. At least not while I knew him. Never did write those stories. And it was always the same sort of case. I don't have the time. It's in here, right? It's locked away. So, you know, I'll get to it. I'll get there. But as far as I know, he never did. Some of these ideas were pretty brilliant. Now, the execution is 80% of it when you're talking about literature, especially when you're talking about literature. Now, even though a lot of the literature that gets out there now is not executed so brilliantly. But the, re- the reason I say that, that it's all about execution now, is if you are going to compete with American letters, with English letters, with world letters today, after the canon that has been built up over the ages, you're going to have to execute on top of having brilliant ideas. But he would always take me aside a little bit when I would talk about my own work. And he would always tell me, you got to get it out. You got to do it. Because once you have a family, once you have a career, once you have children, once you're married, and just scared the bejesus out of me. So that's why I work so hard now with the lifestyle that I've chosen to live. Is it healthy? I don't know. I don't know. But here's something else that I want to talk about in correlation with this poem. It's an actual sort of principle or law that people, by which people live. It's called Parkinson's Law. Parkinson's Law is the observation that public administration, bureaucracy, and officialdom expands, regardless of the amount of work to be done. This was attributed mainly to two factors, that officials want subordinates, not rivals, and that officials make work for each other. It was first published in 1955 by the naval historian C. Northcote Northcote Parkinson as an essay in The Economist. 
He gave as examples the growth in the size of the British Admiralty and Colonial Office, Colonel Office, even though the numbers of their ships and colonies were declining, Colonial Office. Um, and this is sort of, this idea has sort of worked its way out of public administration or bureaucracy or officialdom. And it has become a principle of real life. Parkinson's law, essentially what it states, is that no matter how much work there is to be done, it will expand to cover the allotted time for it. So, in my own life right now, I'm doing 30 videos in 30 days. If you're over on my uh, personal channel, you saw the goals that I have set for this month. And... Regardless of the fact that this video takes 15 minutes, 20 minutes to shoot, an hour to sort of research and develop something beforehand, maybe an hour on the back end of it, editing, uploading, doing the, the title, the tags, a thumbnail, all of this stuff, you're talking two and a half hours on a 15 minute poetry discussion, maybe? I, If I do that, Two and a half hours, probably, it's, that's, a good, that's a good estimate. I have work, eight and a half hours. That's 11 hour footprint. 11 hours footprint, you have 16 hours of waking time if you're sleeping eight hours. It will inevitably sometimes take not two and a half hours to do a poetry discussion. But four, four and a half, maybe I get something to eat in the middle. Maybe I find something on YouTube to watch in the middle. Maybe I find something to watch on YouTube while I'm eating. The meal takes me 10 minutes to eat. The video is 45 minutes long. I sit here and I watch a 45-minute video. All of a sudden, that work that should have been done in 11 and a half hours, 11 hours, takes me the whole day. And you can laugh. You can make fun of me. But I bet it's happening in your life, too. So the reason I want to talk about this Bukowski poem, the reason that this Bukowski poem comes up to me, is this idea, air and light and time and space, it doesn't matter. During the most crimped and cramped portions of my life, when I was making excuses for why I wasn't writing, my mind was on fire. I would have all of these ideas just bustling to get out onto paper. And if I didn't do it, they just stayed in there and multiplied and bred with each other. And all of a sudden, I've got these mixtures of stories. And it's, it, it drives you crazy. And I, I'm not saying that I'm a special case here. If you're here, I would say there's at least a 30% chance that you're a writer and you know this feeling just as well as I do. But if you're here, I guarantee you there is something that gets you in this way. There are people that I have known, certainly not me. There are people I have known who, for whom this is cleaning. So something so mundane as that. And I say mundane because I don't clean anything. I live in a pigsty. I, 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 live, I live in uh, squalor, as they say. But so... There is something, I think, for everyone like this. There are some people for whom this thing is relaxation. So, when all of their life is sort of hustle, bustle, here and there, all they can think about in the back of their head is sitting down and taking a nap. I think this is a universal part of the human condition. And the reason, the ironic reason that we have a poem so sort of miserable and wonderful as this is that the only way this portion of the human experience can be explained is when it's a writer not writing. That's the only way this gets out there because if it, because Charles Bukowski was so good with words. He's able to explain this little portion of his life. Um, and if he had never felt this, he wouldn't have been able to write this poem. There were obviously times in his life where he was making these excuses for himself. 
And in fact, it was not until later in life. He, he, he was someone who was, I believe, struggling to be a novelist. And he felt that he was failing at that. It wasn't until his 30s, I think, that he started writing poetry. Um, so he obviously felt this and went through it too. Now, if you're one of these people who cleaning is the thing for them, you're doing your whole work week in the back of your head. You think, I just got to clean. I just got to clean. I got to get cleaning. And you come home and you get something to eat. Maybe you take a nap. Maybe you do a crossword puzzle. I don't know what people do. That's part of my problem with this. I don't even know what people do. You do these recreational things, but in the back of your mind, the whole time you're thinking, I need to be cleaning. I need to be cleaning. I need to be cleaning. And it's driving you crazy. You don't have necessarily the words or the experience with words to put it on paper like this. So it seems, you know, that this is sort of the mad scientist of writers, the idea that writers are this special breed of people for whom this all-consuming thing just sort of runs around in their mind and they get lost, and when they're not doing it, they go crazy, is not true. It's everyone, and it's something with everyone, but writers have been the only ones with that tool to get it out. But yeah, this is, I, for me, this is a very fitting poem at this point in my life. This is a very fitting poem for doing all the work that I'm doing around um, National Poetry Month. So I, I thought I would share it with you if you've not experienced this poem, read this poem, been through this poem. Yeah, that's all I have for this. We will be back tomorrow with uh, Sylvia Plath. So Sylvia Plath, very popular poet. Be sure to be back for that, a poet with whom I struggle mightily. So if you find yourself here by chance but not design, consider hitting that subscribe button. If you enjoy what I'm doing on this channel and you want to help me out, hitting the like button does the trick. It tells YouTube to share this video with other literature lovers. And hey, I hope to have you back for the next one.